a quick new idea daily from the world's greatest TEDx talks. I'm your host, Atosa Leone, and this is TEDx Shorts. According to David Dow, there are moments in the lives of death row inmates when society had the opportunity to change their path towards incarceration and execution. David's a lawyer who's represented over 100 death row inmates. In today's talk, he advocates for early intervention as a way to prevent these executions and the crimes that prompt them. You can think of a death penalty case as a story that has four chapters. The first chapter of every case is exactly the same, and it is tragic. And it's followed by a trial where that death sentence is ultimately upheld by the state appellate court. The second chapter consists of a complicated legal proceeding known as a state habeas corpus appeal. The third chapter is an even more complicated legal proceeding known as a federal habeas corpus proceeding. And the fourth chapter is one where a variety of things can happen. The lawyers might file a clemency petition, they might initiate even more complex litigation, or they might not do anything at all. But that fourth chapter always ends with an execution. When I started representing death row inmates more than 20 years ago, people on death row did not have a right to a lawyer in either the second or the fourth chapter of this story. They were on their own. In fact, it wasn't until the late 1980s that they acquired a right to a lawyer during the third chapter of the story. So what all of these death row inmates had to do was rely on volunteer lawyers to handle their legal proceedings. The problem is that there were way more guys on death row than there were lawyers who had both the interest and the expertise to work on these cases. And so inevitably, lawyers drifted to cases that were already in chapter four. That makes sense, of course. Those are the cases that are most urgent. Those are the guys who are closest to being executed. Some of these lawyers were successful. They managed to get new trials for their clients. Others of, of them managed to extend the lives of their clients, sometimes by years, sometimes by months. What's happened is that lawyers who represent death row inmates have shifted their focus to earlier and earlier chapters of the death penalty story. Now, you might think that this decline in death sentences and the increase in the number of life sentences is a good thing or a bad thing. I don't want to have a conversation about that today. All that I want to tell you is that the reason that this has happened is because death penalty lawyers have understood that the earlier you intervene in a case, the greater the likelihood that you're going to save your client's life. That's the first thing I've learned. Here's the second thing I learned. I sometimes say, if you tell me the name of a death row inmate, doesn't matter what state he's in, doesn't matter if I've ever met him before, I'll write his biography for you. That's the second lesson that I've learned. Now we're right on the cusp of that corner where everybody is going to agree. But every once in a while, the way you solve a problem is to make it bigger. Okay. The way we solve this problem is to make the issue of the death penalty bigger. We have to say, all right, we have these four chapters of a death penalty story. But what happens before that story begins? How can we intervene in the life of a murderer before he's a murderer? What options do we have to nudge that person off of the path that is going to lead to a result that everybody, death penalty supporters and death penalty opponents, still think is a bad result, the murder of an innocent human being? the people on death row had five chapters in their lives that came before the four chapters of the death penalty story. I think of these five chapters as points of intervention, places in their lives when our society could have intervened in their lives and nudged them off of the path that they were on that created a consequence that we all, death penalty supporters or death penalty opponents, say was a bad result. So I'm not standing here today with the solution. But 
The fact that we still have a lot to learn, that doesn't mean that we don't know a lot already. We know from experience in other states that there are a wide variety of modes of intervention that we could be using in Texas and in every other state that isn't using them in order to prevent a consequence that we all agree is bad. I'll just mention a few. I won't talk today about reforming the legal system. That's probably a topic that's best reserved for a room full of lawyers and judges. Instead, let me talk about a couple of modes of intervention that we can all help accomplish because they are modes of intervention that will come about when legislators and policymakers, when taxpayers and citizens agree that that's what we ought to be doing and that's how we ought to be spending our money. We could be providing early childhood care for economically disadvantaged and otherwise troubled kids. And we could be doing it for free. And we could be nudging kids like Will off of the path that we're on. We could be providing special schools at both the high school level and the middle school level, but even in K through five that target economically and otherwise disadvantaged kids and particularly kids who have had exposure to the juvenile justice system. There's one other thing we can be doing. Well, there are a bunch of other things we can be doing. There's one other thing that we could be doing that I'm going to mention, and this is going to be the only controversial thing that I say today. We could be intervening much more aggressively into dangerously dysfunctional homes. If we're going to do that, we need a place to put them. Even if we do all of those things, some kids are going to fall through the cracks and they're going to end up in that last chapter before the murder story begins. They're going to end up in the juvenile justice system. And even if that happens, it's not yet too late. There's still time to nudge them if we think about nudging them rather than just punishing them. There are two professors in the Northeast, one at Yale and one at Maryland. They set up a school that is attached to a juvenile prison. And the kids are in prison, but they go to school from 8 in the morning until 4 in the afternoon. Now, it was logistically difficult. They had to recruit teachers who wanted to teach inside a prison. They had to establish strict separation between the people who work at the school and the prison authorities. And most dauntingly of all, they needed to invent a new curriculum because you know what? People don't come into and out of prison on a semester basis. Hmm? <laughs> but they did all those things. Now, what do all of these things have in common? What all of these things have in common is that they cost money. Even if you don't agree that there's a moral imperative that we do it. It just makes economic sense. We're going to devote enormous social resources to punishing the people who commit those crimes, and that's appropriate because we should punish people who do bad things. But if we make the picture bigger and devote our attention to the earlier chapters, then we're never going to write the first sentence that begins the death penalty story. The TEDx talk you just listened to was recorded at a TEDx event in Austin, Texas. All TEDx events are independently organized by volunteers who believe in TED's mission of ideas worth spreading. Special thanks to the organizing team at TEDx Austin. Want to listen to more TEDx talks? Explore the entire archive on the TEDx YouTube channel. I'm Atosa Leone. Thanks for listening and see you tomorrow.